Are you ready, kids? Aye, aye, aye Captain. Captain. I can't hear you. Aye, aye, aye Captain. Captain. Oh. Who lives in a council flat in Thames by the sea? Smoke Bob Crackhead. As high as a kite, even more so than me. Smoke Bob Crackhead. His next welfare check is something you wish. Smoke Bob Crackhead. Then shut the hell up and let's talk Atlantis. Ready? Smoke Bob Crackhead. Smoke Bob Crackhead. Smoke Bob Crackhead. Smoke Bob Crackhead. What I'm about to show you is the most disturbing thing I've ever seen in my life. And I've seen London. Your eyes do not deceive you. This isn't something from a movie or a video game, but real-life images captured back in 2007 off the Gulf of Mexico. This is the Magna Pina, aka a big fin squid. Their arms alone are believed to be over twice the size of the average man, and get this, this may just be their toddler form. It's widely believed that an adult Magna Pina has yet to be caught on camera. Thank God. We don't know how they eat. We don't know how they sleep. In fact, we hardly know anything about them. Mostly, as they've only been seen a handful of times since they were first visually discovered back in 1988. 1988? Damn, that wasn't that long ago. What took us so long? What took us so long is that you're not just going to see one of these guys hanging around your local beach. The sea can roughly be divided into three different zones. At the top lies the photic zone, whereby light penetrates the strongest and over 90% of all marine life can be found. Below that is the twilight zone, whereby light starts to dim and life starts to dwindle. Below that is the midnight zone, a totally pitch black environment whereby life was thought to be impossible. Thought to be, of course, as this is where the Magna Pina lurk even as far down as 15,000 feet. Fortunately, they aren't as scary as such imagery may make you believe. In November 2021, much higher quality footage of the Magna Pina was captured, and as you can see, they're actually pretty elegant looking creatures. Somebody's going by above oh, what's us. What's that top? What is that? Ooh, ooh, a squid. Ooh, oh, ooh, yes, a squid. Ooh, ooh follow it. <laughs> Still scary, but not quite as bad as this Half-Life 2 looking thing over here. Oh gosh. Now you're probably thinking, well Alex, that was quite fascinating, but why are you showing me a squid? Well the truth is that I am so tired of seeing people splooge about space. Not a day goes by where I don't hear about some exoplanet NASA has discovered that's only a mere 5,000 light years away. Only! As if I'm going to give the slightest care about Kepler 576b, when in this economy, I'd be lucky to afford a train to Manchester. I can't help but laugh when people try to get me to become as fanatically obsessed with space as they are, by telling me things such as, Did you know that Uranus has 27 moons? Oh, so when Uranus moons, that's interesting, but when I moon my anus, I get arrested. Oh look, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, two of the world's wealthiest men, are once again arguing over who has the biggest rocket. And, uh, and then, I also I want to thank uh, every Amazon employee and every Amazon customer, because you guys paid for all of this. <laughs> so, seriously, for every Amazon customer out there, and every Amazon employee, thank you from the bottom of my heart very much. Uh, it's very appreciated. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Richest man in the world thanks his legion of underpaid warehouse wage slaves for funding his roller coaster trip to space. So let's get this straight. This guy's company pollutes the planet with a Guinness World Record level of waste. And now he's doing everything he can to get off it? No, we certainly don't live in a dystopia, folks. I mean, hell, at least Musk and co are actually making cool things. Reusable rockets? Hey, not a bad idea. But why is it that every other billionaire is determined to make their own rich man's space orgy? Like our very own Richard Branson with his Virgin Galactic, also known as Reddit. I mean, we first landed on the moon in 1969, and it feels like we've done almost bugger all since. 
People back then thought we'd have colonies on Mars at this point. Instead, we get a 480p picture of Pluto's arse crack and everyone loses their marbles. It wasn't until people started to realise the genius of using hexagons have we actually started to get some proper imagery of space. And I mean, fellas, I could have told you that one years ago. But don't get me wrong, I like space as much as the next guy. But I can't help but feel as if some people don't have the priorities in order. I hate to be Mr. Realist armed with the hammer of crushed dreams, but space is not for our generations. Sorry. You're not going to go to Mars and live out your Mass Effect fantasies of flirting with blue alien chicks. Space, unfortunately, is a rich man's game. For now. Though, to be honest, as human beings have become so unbelievably stupid as of late, it wouldn't actually surprise me if we ended up back in caves over the next few decades. No wonder aliens have never come down to talk to us. We've been galactically friend-zoned without the friends. Jokes aside, not that I am joking, I don't understand the obsession some people have with getting off Earth. I mean, there's so much about our own planet that we don't know anything about. I keep hearing the quote, born too late to discover the seas, born too early to discover the stars. Well, the second half might be true, but born too late to discover the seas? We haven't discovered the seas. We only found this monstrosity just 30 years ago. God knows what else is down there. This is from a Japanese TV show from back in 1991. And I know what you're thinking. Wow, they've made hentai in 3D. But folks, this isn't some sort of animation or CGI. That is an actual deep sea creature. Behold, the Siphonophore, I think. Looks like something straight out of a Lovecraft book. Believe it or not, it's not actually one organism, but multiple of them that have merged together to form a sort of interconnected colony of nightmare material. I mean, look at this thing. This is a real photo. Or what about this? The bloody belly comb jelly. This thing looks like it has cool neon lights stripped to the side of it that change colour. Then again, it also kind of looks like a ball sack as well, but hey, nobody's perfect. I mean, you spaceheads want to see an alien. Well, why are you fantasizing about little green men at the other side of the galaxy when you have this thing right under you? We humans are beings of light and earth. These creatures are beings of dark and water, the exact opposite of us in almost every way. And yet, they are still clearly alive and somewhat intelligent, as anyone who's ever handled an octopus will tell you. But it's not just weird visuals, there's also been odd, unidentified sounds that have been heard deep below the waves too. I mean, what the hell was that? The point I'm trying to make is, there's some really weird stuff going on down there. And yet, no one seems to care. When it comes to space organisations, there are a dime a dozen. But when it comes to mapping the darkest depths of our planet, we're snoozing. We know for a fact that the vast majority of Earth's mass is molten lava, starting with the mantle just under the Earth's crust. And yet, to this day, we've never actually seen what it actually looks like. That's insanity. You'd think perhaps the United Nations would take a moment out of their time from being completely useless as per usual, and perhaps, oh I don't know, do something. If I was the UN Secretary General, I'd gather all the wealthiest nations on Earth. The Americans, the Chinese, British, French... Well, not the French actually. And then I'd say, Right chaps, how about as a diplomatic bonding exercise, if we gave you fellows a cheeky billion dollars, could you all work together to map the entirety of Earth's underwater terrain? Cheers. And before you know it, world peace has been achieved, and we found the Krakens. Job done. But it's not just underwater creatures we could find. What about underwater civilizations? We know that our Earth has changed drastically over the thousands of years since its creation. It's believed that all of the continents we know and love today were originally conjoined together as one supercontinent, known as Pangaea. And only over time did the Earth's tectonic plates slowly shift to form the world we see today. We also know that there's been land that was once above the sea that has since sank below it, a lot of which had human inhabitants. Back in medieval times, my nation of the United Kingdom was not actually a United Kingdom at all. Well, not much has changed really, but I digress. 
In the past, what we know today as the UK was actually many different little kingdoms, such as Wessex, Mercia, and my ancestral home of Northumbria. In the southeast lied the kingdom of the East Angles, which had a capital city called Dunwich. I can almost guarantee that unless you live there, you've probably never heard of it. But at its peak, Dunwich was an international port city that was said to even rival London. But you'll notice how I said was. That's because due to a series of natural disasters, such as storms and coastal erosion, most of Dunwich essentially fell into the sea, and today, hardly anything of the once thriving capital remains. Remember when I said Dunwich rivaled London during its peak? Well, for reference, the population of London today is over 10 million. Do you know what the population of Dunwich is today? Have a guess. Maybe 5 million? Nope. 1 million? Nope. 500,000? Nope. 100,000? Nope, nope, nope. How about 183? Yeah. But if you thought a sunken city was crazy, then how about a sunken country? This is a satellite map of Northwest Europe, and I'm sure you've seen this many times before. Unless you're American. To name some important countries on this map, we have the UK and... That's it. But did you know that Europe didn't always look like this? In fact, there was once a time when you could walk all the way from Britain to France, as they were actually connected by land. Horrifying! Over 6,000 years ago, it's estimated that Northwest Europe actually looked like this, with Britain not being an island, but a mere peninsula. But hang on a minute, what is this? This, my friends, is what we refer to today as Doggerland. Now, Doggerland was not an actual nation per se, but a name we retroactively attached to the land. What we today call Doggerland was once a thriving farmland inhabited by tribal Europeans. However, a combination of rising sea levels with what was believed to be a tsunami completely submerged the land and buried it underwater to history. Had Doggerland never been submerged, it's almost impossible for us to estimate what it would have been like today. But what we do know for sure is that its sinking completely changed the course of human history in ways that we can't possibly comprehend. Amazingly, however, in recent years, archaeological searches have started to take place in what would have been Doggerland, and some findings have actually been made, such as this gargantuan woolly mammoth skull. Pretty insane. Alright, so we've seen a sunken city, a sunken country, well how about the full bang, a sunken continent? I'm sure almost everyone watching this has heard of New Zealand, a beautiful country full of fantastic people, yet is, at the same time, Another typical Western neoliberal state that doesn't give the slightest damn about its citizens at all. With a Prime Minister that was trained by none other than New Labour. But, uh, that's a story for another time. New Zealand is, of course, just off the coast of Australia, and in comparison to it, is extremely tiny. But, this wasn't always the case. In fact, New Zealand was once similar in size to its brother, a sunken continent that we today refer to as Zealandia. Millions of years ago, Zealandia was a massive island that was estimated to be almost 2 million square miles, though over the centuries slowly started to sink, leading to today, whereby 94% of what was once Zealandia is now totally submerged, with only New Zealand and other minuscule islands still remaining above the waves. Ball's Pyramid, and yes, that is its real name, a small volcano stack in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, is widely believed to have been once part of the continent. Unfortunately, unlike Doggerland, as the continent sank so many millions of years ago, there is thus far no evidence to suggest that there has ever been any human activity present there before it was submerged. Sad times. Still, pretty interesting to think that New Zealand is essentially just 6% of the leftover terrain of what was once a much bigger beast. Insanity. I don't know about you, but I find this sort of stuff absolutely fascinating. Deep sea stuff makes me smile like my dog does after I tell him he doesn't stink that much today. What are you smiling? <laughs> but if we're going to talk about underwater lost civilizations, then we just have to talk about Atlantis. Atlantis is a place that needs no introduction, a long-lost mythical city-state that was said to have disappeared under the sea many centuries ago. 
but hardly anyone knows the true history of how the legend came to be in the first place. The vast majority of people seem to be under the illusion that Atlantis is some sort of recently crafted legend, as if it's from a Disney film or something like that. But this simply isn't the case. The legend of Atlantis is actually over 2,000 years old, even older than Christianity. So, where do we begin? The story goes that around 600 BC, a Greek legislator called Solon travelled around and met some Egyptian priests, who told Solon of an ancient circular city-state that was, during its time, extremely powerful, rich and influential. So much so, in fact, that the city even apparently had its own imperialist empire, which spanned many other cities and was led by its king, Atlas. This city was, of course, Atlantis. Solon supposedly then passed this knowledge down to his friends and family, who would continue to pass down such information for decades, until it reached a man called Critias. Critias would then go on to meet Plato, one of the most influential Greek philosophers of all time, who documented Critias' words about Atlantis down in text. It should be noted, however, that the actual tree of information is unclear, with different sources saying different things. Some say that Critias was a fictional character that Plato made up, others say he was a real person. For all we know, it could have been me who told Plato. We just have no idea. But regardless, according to Plato's texts, Atlantis sank around the year 9600 BC, though the sinking was apparently not of natural causes, but instead, well, listen to this. The nation destroyed itself via irreverent use of dangerous supernatural powers, whereby it was then sunk into the ocean by a series of earthquakes, largely believed to be crafted by the gods in response to Atlantis's growing materialism. Hmm. Sounds familiar. The city was documented to be destroyed in a single night, not slowly over many decades. Hence, why its destruction was not believed to be natural. Overall, however, a pretty cool mythological story with quite an interesting lesson. And most people would just leave it at that. However, as shocking as it may sound, some people actually believe that they've found tangible physical evidence for the real existence of Atlantis. In the deserts of Mauritania lies an unusual geological dome known as the Rickat structure. As you can see, the Rickat structure is extremely bizarre a massive multi-ringed construct slap bang in the middle of nowhere. Herodotus, another ancient Greek fellow, supposedly made a map of the world as it was known back then. And this map, as you can see, features numerous different places that correspond with our world today. And right in the lower left corner, as you can see, the map states Atlantis. And it just so happens that the part of the world whereby this so-called Atlantis was marked on the map is today in the nation of Mauritania, which just so happens to be the same place where the Rickat structure is. In addition, the first recorded king of Mauritania was supposedly called Atlas, the same name as the mythical king of Atlantis. And so, with the Rickat structure, the Herodotus map, and the Atlas king correspondence, many people have come to the overwhelming conclusion that the Rickat structure must be Atlantis. In fact, there are even videos all across the internet that regurgitate this exact same conclusion without question. The Rickat structure is Atlantis. End of story. But, really? I mean, look, this is obviously a very interesting story and there's a lot of coincidences here, but there's a lot of holes in this. From my observations, there are three main problems with this theory. Number one, unreliable narrators. I mean, let's get this straight. Solon supposedly learned about Atlantis from some random Egyptian priests who then passed it down to someone, who then passed it down to Critias, who then passed it down to Plato, who then wrote it down for us. I mean, this reminds me of that game where people whisper into each other's ears, whereby you then go around the room and see just how messed up the original message became. Any one of these men could have been flat out lying, exaggerating, adding their own opinions on top of it, or just misremembering the details, and we wouldn't be none the wiser. Hence, why Atlantis has been largely relegated by historians as simply being a work of fiction. And look, I get it. I mean, after all, this wouldn't be the first time history has confused us. One of the great mysteries of history is why, in a ton of medieval art pieces, there appears to be illustrations of medieval knights battling giant snails. 
Sometimes the knights are even drawn to be begging the snails for mercy, even with the snails seemingly yelling at the knights. Naturally, this absolutely flabbergasted historians, as there are of course no such man-sized snails around today. Which led many people to wonder if perhaps, many hundreds of years ago, there were in fact such beasts and that we eventually made them extinct. However, there has been zero fossils or any biological trace of such large snails at all. Which begs the question, what the hell were medieval artists playing at? Well, as we all know, snails are slow, small, and well, pretty weak. No offence to any snails watching this. And so, having a knight, someone renowned for their strength, fighting a snail is somewhat ironic in a humorous fashion. I suppose what I'm trying to say is that this, as strange as it may sound, could be some sort of medieval meme. However, because we obviously can't raise medieval people from the dead in necromancy style and ask them directly, we may never truly know just what the hell this was all about. And the same logic also sadly applies to Atlantis. As alluded to earlier, Plato was a philosopher, and a philosopher's job is to literally make stuff up. As cool as the idea of Atlantis is, the reality is, Plato probably just made it up as to prove a philosophical point about not letting materialism overtake belief in the divine. Which, hey, is a pretty damn good lesson for the people of the degenerative West today. It's a shame that rather than focus on that, we instead delude ourselves into believing in the actual city instead, completely missing the point that Plato was trying to make. Number two. Where's the Egyptian records of Atlantis? Solon heard about Atlantis supposedly through Egyptian priests. Well, if that was true, that would mean the Egyptians would have held on to the knowledge of Atlantis for over nine millennia. Nine thousand years. So why, if they managed to hold on to that information for that long, do they have no records of this event today? Surely if anyone was to know about Atlantis, it would be the Egyptians, not the Greeks, as they only received such information from them. And yet, there are no Egyptian records of Atlantis at all. Also, are we just going to ignore the fact that A. Atlantis literally translates to Atlas's island, B. Atlas was one of the Greek titans, and C. According to Plato's texts, Atlantis apparently tried and failed to invade ancient Athens. With all due respect, this story is clearly of Greek origin. And number three, it just doesn't make any bloody sense. Herodotus, the man who supposedly marked Atlantis on his map of the known world, died just two years after Plato's birth. How the hell would he possibly know about Atlantis? Never mind where it was. Atlantis supposedly sank in 9600 BC. This guy wouldn't be born until over 9000 years later. Not only that, but all of Herodotus' supposed maps clearly aren't from the year 430 BC as marked. Every single map you find on the internet was clearly created in modern times. Easily identifiable not just by their mint condition, but, oh, I don't know, the blatantly printed text? Where is the original map then, I hear you ask? Well, the truth is, there is no original. Herodotus never made a map. All these maps are not more than modern day renditions based upon his writings. Well, all right then, Alex, that's pretty lame, but what was the whole Atlantis map marking about then? Well, it just so happens in the exact same place whereby Herodotus marked Atlantis is a mountain range literally called the Atlas Mountains. So you tell me what's more likely. Was Herodotus, a man born in 484 BC, marking a city that supposedly sank in the year 9600 BC, that by the way, he wasn't even aware of, or just marking down the Atlas Mountains? Yeah. And as for the actual human king of Mauritania, Atlas, he was supposedly alive during 600 BC not 9,600 BC. So unless this guy was alive for over 9,000 years, this ain't the same King Jack. So to conclude, Herodotus's maps weren't even his, the Rickat structure is cool, but there's no evidence to suggest at all that it was once a city, and the Atlantis Greek god Atlas clearly ain't the same guy as the Mauritanian Atlas. Folks, I hate to sound like a debunker from the Atlantis Misinformation Committee, but the reality is that Atlantis ain't real. 
The amount of people who, despite doing almost no research themselves, can be made to believe that Atlantis is real by watching one video on YouTube is honestly astounding, and makes me realise just how moronic the average person actually is. Pro tip folks, just because someone puts a bunch of red circles and arrows over satellite images, doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. In fact, in all likelihood, they're probably just trying to make money from your naivety. You know, the truth is that the modern man has a really boring life, that they attempt to spice up by latching onto mythological tales such as these. Myths like Atlantis annoy me, because people shouldn't latch on to what is a blatant work of fiction when there's so much more weird and bizarre things that are actually happening in reality. Seriously, some people on the internet eat up nonsense quicker than my dog eats a melon. Melon? There you go. Melon? 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 You like that? However, that's not to say that there aren't real underwater mysteries that haven't yet been found. So rather than latch onto furry tales, wouldn't it be great if we actually, oh, I don't know, explored it? It's estimated that just 5% of our oceans thus far have been explored. 5%! I mean, we truly have no idea whatsoever what's actually going on down there. Seriously, forget the rich bourgeoisie space heads and their stupid rockets. Instead, give me a billion dollars and me and my crew will have every last drop of water on this earth charted in days. Well, either that or I just build my own underwater city like something out of Bioshock, but hey, whatever. Mm -hmm.